which is loftier, the language of systematic theology or the language of the mystics? The great Thomist, Reginald Gerger Lagrange, raises this question as he begins his second volume of the Three Ages of the Interior Life. Which of these two terminologies is the loftier? Now, when I first read this, I imagined I knew how he was going to answer the question. I imagined that he was going to say, the analogical language of systematic theology is loftier, and the language of the mystics, as metaphorical, is lower. But no, he actually says, it's the language of the mystics that is loftier. He reasons this is the case because the terminology of the mystics comes from a higher knowledge, infused contemplation. Here are the words of Gary Lagrange. The more elevated terminology is the one that expresses a loftier thought. Now infused contemplation, in spite of its obscurity and lack of precision, is loftier than theological speculation. Therefore, the language of the mystics, which expresses this contemplation, is more elevated than that of theologians." End quote. Gary Lagrange goes on to explain there's a trade-off here. The language of the mystics is loftier, but the language of speculative theology is more exact and precise. Personally, I'm not interested in making an argument for which is loftier. I simply want to stress that there is a very important place for both. And I want to expand this in terms of what this means for a Thomistic approach to the Eucharistic revival. To do this, we will first look at the place of infused contemplation in the life of the Christian theologian and the metaphorical discourse that can flow from this. Second, we will look at the harmony between theological wisdom and mystical wisdom, especially as expressed by the Dominican St. Catherine of Siena and John Towler. Third and finally, we will consider a couple of examples from both Catherine and Towler of using mystical language to give expression to Thomistic doctrine on the Eucharist. And we'll consider how this might affect our own approach to the Eucharistic revival. So first, the mystical life and metaphorical discourse in the life of the Christian theologian. Christian theology as a speculative science has its own proper spirit. St. Thomas Aquinas often operates here, yet he also discourses in the language of the mystics, to use Gary Lagrange's phrase, and this helps demystify for us the language of the mystics, right? Aquinas wrote profound speculative theology, but he also wrote equally profound Eucharistic hymns. He operated in both spheres, speculative theology and mystical theology. And in part two, we'll consider how harmonious these spheres are. And here at a conference dedicated to a grassroots Eucharistic revival, it's worth noting that Aquinas' most significant influence on grassroots Catholicism and a lively revival of the soul has probably come not so much from his writings of speculative theology as from these poetic Eucharistic hymns. They are a sparkling treasure in the life of the church, the whole church. Adoro te devote, ponche lingua, sacri soli mis, lauda zion, and so forth. Gerard Lagrange sees this mystical language as coming from a higher knowledge, infused contemplation. And perhaps this too needs to be demystified and brought into the orbit of us trudging along the ordinary paths of Christian life. Here we should note the pains at which Gerard Lagrange and his confrères strive to show how infused contemplation is part of the call of ordinary Christian life. The mystical life is the ordinary unfolding of the life of grace in the soul. It is the full flowering of the theological virtues and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And everyone in the state of grace has these gifts and theological virtues, which are already active to some degree. Infused contemplation 
involves the theological virtues and the activation of the gifts of understanding and wisdom especially, yielding a deeper penetration of the truth and a tasting of divine things. Dominicans like Gary Lagrange, Antonio Arroyo, and Juan Aaron Terrell led the early 20th century movement arguing for the so-called universal call to the mystical life. And we can catch a glimpse of how pressing and crucial of a matter this was from a charming little anecdote. So venerable Juan Aaron Terrell on his deathbed utters a declaration of faith about the universal call to infuse contemplation and says on record, Within a few hours, I shall be brought before the tribunal of God. And I assure you that our teachings concerning contemplation are the true doctrines, and that they represent the traditional Christian teaching. But the contrary doctrines are deviations, which serve only to mislead souls. Amen. <laughs> on his deathbed. <laughs> on his deathbed. <laughs> what sorts of things will we find ourselves defending on our deathbed? So as we fast forward to our current catechism of the Catholic Church, it's not difficult to see catechism number 2014 as putting the church's stamp of approval on the work of these Dominicans and others. Catechism 2014 says, spiritual progress tends toward ever more intimate union with Christ. This union is called mystical because it participates in the mystery of Christ through the sacraments, the holy mysteries, and in him, in the mystery of the Holy Trinity, God calls us all to this intimate union with him, even if the special graces or extraordinary signs of this mystical life are granted only to some for the sake of manifesting the gratuitous gift given to all. We could and should have a whole conference just on this one paragraph and open up the treasures here, maybe next year. And I think this teaching and truth of Catechism 2014 ought to shape our approach to Eucharistic revival and our discourse about God and the spiritual life. So to conclude this first section, I wanna say just a little more about these two modes of discourse, that of systematic theology and that of the mystics. And again, remember the language of the mystics can be as down to earth and heavenly as St. Thomas's Eucharistic hymns. Thomas, of course, acknowledges the importance of metaphor in discoursing about the faith, both in his theory and in his practice, but he does not give much of an account of how the language of the mystics differs from the language of speculative theology. The best succinct account of this comes from a figure schooled in the medieval speculative theology, including Thomism, someone also called the mystic of mystics. St. John of the Cross, in the prologue to his spiritual canticle, masterfully develops a distinction between mystical theology and scholastic theology. The term mystical theology as used here is not like a subject matter next to the subject matter of spiritual theology, but rather mystical theology is an actual infusion of the knowledge of God in contemplative prayer and then attempting to give expression to this higher knowledge of God, obscure as it may be. In his spiritual canticle, John sees his 40 stanzas of poetry as an exercise of mystical theology, which he goes on to comment on stanza by stanza using scholastic theology. In the prologue, John dedicates his spiritual canticle to Madre Ana de Jesus and addresses her in these words. Even though your reverence lacks training in scholastic theology, through which the divine truths are understood, you are not wanting in mystical theology, which is known through love, and by which these truths are not only known, but at the same time enjoyed. Mm -hmm. Section three of the prologue. The purpose of scholastic theology is the understanding of the divine truths, while the purpose of mystical theology is the enjoyment of these truths through God's grace and action in the soul and as love is stirred up. We can think here of Aquinas describing the gift of wisdom as giving us an experiential knowledge of God, an enjoyment of God, a tasting of God. Sapientia comes from support. 
One of the few authorities that John of the Cross actually quotes and refers to by name is St. Thomas, precisely on the gift of wisdom, which John calls mystical wisdom. So we can see John's elaboration on mystical theology here as describing what comes forth from the, this gift of the Holy Spirit of wisdom that Aquinas treasures so much. In his prologue to Spiritual Canticle, John also elaborates on the mode of discourse that flows forth from mystical wisdom. And I find this so helpful. He says, The wisdom and charity of God is so vast, as the Book of Wisdom states, that it reads from end to end, and the soul informed and moved by this wisdom bears in some way this abundance and impulsiveness in her words. The Spirit of the Lord who abides in us and aids our weakness, as St. Paul says, pleads for us with unspeakable groanings in order to manifest what we can neither fully understand nor comprehend. As a result, these persons let something of their experience overflow in figures, comparisons, similitudes, and from the abundance of their spirit, pour out secrets and mysteries rather than rational explanations. Section 1 of John's prologue of Spiritual Canticle, John the Crosses. So here we see the value of metaphor not just in making sublime truths more accessible to simple people, which taken alone would indeed make metaphor less than analogical scholastic theology, but we see here how metaphor is also more suited to the pouring forth of the overflow and abundance of what was enjoyed and tasted of God through charity and the gift of wisdom, and in manifesting mystery through a more poetic discourse. Metaphor is more suited to the obscurity of the divine mode in which the gifts of wisdom and understanding operate, in the tasting and penetrating deeper into the infinite God. Furthermore, it's communicated in a mode that's meant not simply to increase understanding in the reader, but to stir up love in his encounter with the same living and mysterious Lord. A Eucharistic revival is especially in need of this, the soul revived and invigorated with love for the mystery of our Eucharistic Lord. So second, using Catherine of Siena and John Toller, I want to open up the harmony that exists between speculative theology and mystical theology, or put otherwise, theological wisdom and mystical wisdom. It's as harmonious, for instance, as St. Thomas's speculative doctrine on the Eucharist and his hymns about the Eucharist. It's as harmonious as John of the Cross's use of scholastic theology to comment on his mystical poetry. It is as harmonious as the life of sacred study and the life of contemplative prayer. We've noted how Catechism 2014 enshrines the teaching of the early 20th century movement among Dominicans, especially for the universal call to the mystical life. But there are at least two other Dominicans earlier who should also be included in this movement. And for them, the Eucharist is explicitly at the center of it all. And I speak of Catherine of Siena and John Powell. They call all Christians to the heights of this mystical life through the sacramental life. John Towler and the Rhineland mystics are especially explicit in emphasizing the call of all people to the heights of the mystical life. They preach their sublime doctrine to all the faithful, including the ordinary Catholics just showing up for Mass, and maybe even a little late for Mass. The language of the mystics, while being sublime, is at the same time accessible. And this can be very helpful for a grassroots Eucharistic revival. Right? Sometimes in trying to make things more accessible, people dumb down the faith. But here is a better way. In communicating St. Thomas's speculative theology on the Eucharist to the common Catholic and the pew, the advantage of the language of the mystics is that it can make the teaching accessible while remaining sublime. Both accessible and sublime, like the Eucharistic hymns of St. Thomas. Now, a theologian who wishes to utilize both forms of discourse Thankfully, he need not be a poet himself. 
A well-chosen mystical quote from a saint can accomplish the same purpose. And our current catechism does this quite well with its intentionally numerous quotes from the saints. But it's worth considering further this relationship between speculative theology and mystical theology, theological wisdom and mystical wisdom. Catherine of Siena and John Pollard can help, especially as they are Dominican mystics who treasure veritas, the truth in their mind and in their heart. In Dialogue, section 66, from St. Catherine, we find a very simple statement that expresses well this harmony between theological wisdom and mystical wisdom. Catherine hears God say, one who knows more, loves more, and loving more, enjoys more. It's a simple three-step progression that tends to happen in the Christian soul. Knowing leads to loving, which leads to an enjoying or tasting of the Lord. The claim is not that this third step happens by necessity or according to the in inherent nature of things, but that in the lived experience of study and prayer, the Christian tends to move from knowing to loving to enjoying, tasting, savoring. The last of this three-step progression has all the marks of the gift of wisdom, mystical wisdom. Catherine gives articulate accounts of this enjoying and tasting. She says in Dialogue 28, for instance, through love and the light of faith, they taste eternal truth. And in letter T227, her language is more colorful and metaphorical. She says, having come to know the truth in the blood, we become drunk on the experience of God in the affection of charity by the light of most holy faith. The harmony between theological and mystical wisdom is similar to the harmony between philosophical wisdom and theological wisdom. Philosophical wisdom cannot reach theological wisdom on its own without God's grace, yet philosophical wisdom can dispose for, prepare for, and help theological wisdom along the way. In a similar way, theological wisdom can dispose for, prepare for, and help mystical wisdom, even as mystical wisdom depends on the initiation of the Holy Spirit and activating the gift of wisdom. Wisdom orders all things sweetly, suaviter, there's a smoothness here. We speak often about the harmony of faith and reason. Perhaps we should speak just as much about the harmony of theological and mystical wisdom. Adapting Catherine's 16th line, we could say, one who knows more through speculative theology, loves more, and loving more, enjoys and tastes more in mystical wisdom. And he attempts to share the excess of this more using mystical language. John Tyler gives his own expression to this harmony between theological and mystical wisdom. Studying the words of scripture leads to an enjoyment and tasting of the word the second person of the Trinity. Study the inspired word of God, sometimes through a new grace, leads to God the Father uttering a spirit-empowered word into the soul in infused contemplation. And this brings something new to birth in the soul. This is a world of John Pollard. In this so-called birth of the word in the soul, which is so central for the Rhineland mystics, we hear echoes of St. Thomas's teaching on the invisible missions of Son and Spirit as a word breathing forth love sent to the soul by the Father. For Tower, this anointed word spoken by the Father anew into the soul is a hidden word. And he appreciates the paradox of a hidden word and shows how it causes us to keep seeking intellectually, even as the hidden word escapes a straightforward articulation by us. He says in his sermon for the Sunday after Christmas, quote, In this obscure knowledge of God, which acts within the soul, the soul is fixed fast and keeps on constantly inquiring. Hence the wise man's teaching that God's hidden word was uttered amid the quiet silence of all things in a very secret way, entering stealthily into my soul beyond the detection of the senses. 
And the benefit of this is that it makes us keep inquiring and seeking. Since it is with us and yet is hidden, appears and yet is concealed. And so as a result, we must yearn and sigh after it. End quote. In other words, the soul's search for knowledge continues, but now she is captivated by this one thing, the one thing necessary that she keeps going more deeply into. This obscure, anointed knowledge of God through infused contemplation, the soul keeps on inquiring in this and seeking intellectually through this hidden word, which manifests while so much remains concealed because of the utter mystery of God. So, to Catherine's short line, we can add something that turns into a perpetual series throughout this life. One who knows more, loves more, and loving more, enjoys more. And in enjoying and tasting more, he seeks to know more, which leads him to love more, which leads him to enjoy and taste more, and so on. Okay, I see my, my time is, is limited. So the third part, examples of Pollard and Catherine uh, in today's Eucharist or Revival. So, you know, just, uh, just a couple of examples. I'll just very quickly summarize. You know, so John Paul, he is explicit and quotes St. Thomas on the Eucharist, and then kind of builds on it. And in fact, his quotation of St. Thomas is more of a summary. He says, the words of St. Thomas in some measure aid us that all the glory, grace, and happiness that our Lord Jesus Christ brought to the world with his humanity, living, suffering, dying, rising again, and ascending into heaven, that all of this he bestows on every single man with his holy body of blood. Right, so we're going to see that for Toller at the center, at the heights of the mystical life, is the Eucharist. And it's a union that comes uh, through the Eucharist and the sacraments. He encourages us to allow the Lord, as we receive in, in Holy Communion, to allow the Lord to press close in to us and to sink so deep within us, to be so entirely made one with us as possibly could be. You know, and just another example. You know, St. Thomas talks about uh, with the sacraments that there's a conformity that's brought about between us uh, to Christ crucified. And so Tyler gives this beautiful account using Augustine and Bernard that, yeah, we consume the Lord in the Eucharist, but the Lord also consumes us. Through the trials of life, he bites at us, <laughs> tears away the old man, and this conformity to Christ crucified, and we're absorbed by the Lord, so to speak, Right, normal food we turn into ourselves, but in the Eucharist, what we receive, we're turned into. And Catherine of Siena, just a couple of examples. Um, and she is influenced by Thomas's Eucharistic hymns in a, a special way. But building on St. Thomas's teaching of the invisible missions of Son and Spirit, she talks about, and this is Dialogue 110 and 112, that the Eucharist received leaves an imprint on the soul of wisdom coming from the Son and the imprint of love coming from the Holy Spirit. So the invisible missions of Son and Spirit as applied to Eucharist and Holy Communion. And we can see, you know, St. Thomas's teaching about faith and charity and the sacraments of faith giving us a real contact with the Passion of Christ. We can see that expressed in St. Catherine's devotion to the blood. Right? For St. Catherine, the blood hasn't dried, it hasn't grown cold, it's still warm and alive. And there's a real contact with the passion of Christ in the blood. She says, letter T-158, I long to see you bathed, immersed in the blood of Christ crucified, and hidden in his open side. In the blood you will discover fire, because it was shed for love. And in his open side, you will find hearty love, a strong love. For Christ shows that everything that he does in us is done with such hearty love. Then your soul will be set ablaze with the fire of holy desire, a desire that is an impulse of love. Catherine's rich spirituality of the blood echoes what Aquinas wrote a century earlier. The angelic doctrine being a model for us, along with Catherine and Toller, in using mystical language that revives the soul and revives the life of the church. Like what St. Thomas says in Adoro Te Devote, stanza six, prefiguring Catherine's words, 
Like what tender tales tell of the pelican. Bathe me, Jesus, Lord, and what thy bosom ran. Blood that but one drop of has the power to win all the world forgiveness of its world of sin. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for your beautiful and engaging words in a conference often focused on the mind. Thank you for addressing the heart. Um, speaking of metaphor, uh, metaphor is so key in pastoral life. We begin our life of faith in metaphor, and as you're pointing out, sort of the goal, the end, is to end life in metaphor. Um, have you considered any useful metaphors to discuss the connection between theological and uh, mystical uh, theology for the lay person? Just what comes to mind right now uh, is maybe we can think of theological wisdom as uh, a candle burning and then mystical wisdom, uh, that candle being brought out into the sunlight. Uh, not, to, not to suggest mystical wisdom is the end of the vision, because I mean, that's where kind of this uh, image fails, um, but a sense of, yeah, continuity of light, uh, but that is much more expansive and profound and, and bright as it is obscure. <laughs> Maybe this, uh, a candle brought out into um, the sun covered over by some clouds. Yeah, I'm still letting the, the light shine through. So there we go. <laughs> Works on the fly. Right. Real quick question. Uh, thank you, Father, for that. And there's a nice symmetry between what you said and what Father Markey said as well. Really nice uh, to hear both papers back to back. Um, there have been a number of uh, theologians who have um, cooperated with mystics in writing their theology, you know, von Balthasar and, and uh, von Speyer and so on. Um, they sometimes produce amazing things and other times get a little bit off track. So I'm wondering, in this uh, call for a revival of the mystical emphasis in spiritual doctrine, theological doctrine, um, how can things be kept sort of on track, I guess? Yeah, right. yeah, not to reduce the relationship between theological wisdom and mystical wisdom to this, but yeah, a great function of theological wisdom is it's kind of guardrails on, on the road. <laughs> you know, obviously, if a mystic says something, that falls outside the scope or contradicts uh, theological wisdom, yeah, then you're off, off the rails. Um, and so, yeah, more attention to that. And so, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, right, the theologians become too much affected by the mystic <laughs> and start to mirror <laughs> the mystic's language uh, when he should really let, you know, theology, systematic theology, um, guide his thinking and keeping things on track. I say that. All right, Father Gregory, good to see you again. Thanks for your talk, it was great, I enjoyed it. Um, I'm wondering like, what the place of defeat in mystical discourse is. I think sometimes when people describe theological discourse, they're made nervous by the appearance of victory. It's like, yes, we've staked it out, yes, we've defined it, yes, we've said the things. And, and, and then in mystical discourse, there's kind of comparable experience of defeat, whereby you are overcome by the phenomenon, or where you lack the language to describe the thing you've experienced or just don't experience the thing even though others have the language to describe it. Um, so yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm just wondering what your thoughts would be on maybe the place of defeat or disappointment, dissatisfaction might be in this Eucharistic revival if you have thoughts along those lines. Yeah, you know, the, um, the language of Dionysius suffering divine things, uh, being passive to the action of God in the soul. You know, it's interesting, you know, John of the Cross follows that language, quotes that explicitly, St. Thomas does as well. 
And so the defeat of uh, the mystic or the defeat of our um, approaching God and just of the lack of comprehension, it's a defeat that involves, I would say, the suffering of divine things. But at the same time, as it feels like a defeat, even when it seems like a lack of experience of what others are describing, <laughs> like in the dark night or something of the spirit, um, that you know, it still is actually a, a suffering of divine things. It's this authentic uh, prayer and infused contemplation. Um, but yeah, in that beautiful defeat, the soul is brought to, to greater humility in that as well. And as St. Thomas says about humility, yeah, it makes us submissive to God and opens us to the influx of divine grace. So at the same time as the defeat is happening and the soul is humbled more and more, uh, there's a, an opening more for the influx of divine grace. Um, and so just to note how all that is at play. And so John Powler, you know, his preferred way of talking about deep reunion with God is not so much the ascent to God as sinking more deeply into God. Uh, in the ground of the soul. And he says, God is found in the abyss of your humility. God is found in the abyss of our humility. So that that's what feels like a defeat. Uh, we can't say anymore. We've exhausted all we can say about it. And might even feel like a defeat in, in more profound ways. Um, is going deeper into the abyss of humility. And actually sinking more deeply into God. And his, his, you know, participating more deeply in his life. So I would just yeah. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, Father Ignatius, and as this gentleman mentioned, it was a gift to hear the uh, extended metaphor talk for about an hour between both of these papers, uh, touching on, on similar themes here. Finally, 